He he escapes Taif, bloodied and completely bloodied and muddled, and he stands in a, in a corner. He finds a place to pray. And at the time, some jinns were passing by. So they started listening to the Qur'an. When they finished listening, they started commenting on what they just heard. So they start having this, this commentary on what they just heard. And this commentary is recorded in the Qur'an. But the question is... Assalamu alaikum. Before you begin this video, just quickly wanted to let you know that so much of the work on the Qur'an has been completed on Bayina TV. I want you to enjoy systematically studying the Qur'an from the beginning all the way to the end in brief and then in great detail. And to do that, I'd like for you to sign up on BayinaTV.com. And once you appreciate what's going on in Bayina TV, I want you to become an ambassador for it and share that subscription with friends and family and give it as a gift also. Thank you. A'udhu billahi minash rajim وَالَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّنَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُّبِينٍ رَبِّ اشْتَحْ لِي صَدْرِي وَيَسِرْ لِي أَمْرِي وَحْلُ الْعُقْتَةً مِّنْ لِسَانِ يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي فَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ وَالصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ أَجْمَعِينَ أَمَّا بَعْدْ Everyone, once again, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. It's good to see all of you, mashallah. Um, I really like Stuttgart, but I don't think Stuttgart likes me very much. The allergies here are, my God. I decided to go for a walk in the morning, but right next to a like a field of pollen. <laughs> I'm still paying for it. Okay, anyway. Um, in any case, uh, the agenda today, let me just make that clear. My hope today is we can finish ayah number two. That's it. That's all we're going to do. Okay. Uh, it's just that, is that loaded? I made a new plan with my team. Hopefully we can finish ayahs number three to five tomorrow and then five to eight the next day and so on. We can get to number 11 because the other ayah don't require as much detail. But like I told you, this is the central ayah of the surah. And I really do want to do it justice. In fact, even as I'm trying to do it some justice, I want to start by saying that there's an amazing uh, PhD thesis on the last word of this four phrase, four term phrase, al-hikmah, al-hikmah meaning wisdom, um, that Dr. Saqib Hussain, one of our colleagues at the Bayana team, our research team, he, he did a PhD paper on wisdom in the Quran, because wisdom is one of the phrases used in uh, this ayah. Um, and it's particular to this ayah and just over the entire Quran and in biblical studies and in Christian studies and philosophy studies and how the Quran deals with the subject of wisdom and what it calls wisdom. It's a really amazing paper. It's about 350 pages. But it's pretty amazing. And um, I was going to include some of that in the lecture series here because wisdom is coming up. But I decided not to do that because if I did that, the next seven days would be just about wisdom. So, but what I intend to do after this is done is actually go back to that paper, summarize it. Because what I do is I read and research papers like those, like PhD level papers, but then I make them human so that the rest of us can understand what's being said right so that's kind of what i try to do so my intention is in fact to do a series probably end up doing a youtube series on wisdom in the quran and how to understand wisdom in the quran and in, in what what, is, what does the quran mean by wisdom some of those things will come up today so the the warning ahead of time the disclaimer ahead of time is the discussion i'm having today is not comprehensive enough yet it is to the best of my understanding some of the things that i find the most compelling about the subject of wisdom that we will talk about that today, but not in a comprehensive way. So let's begin again. I'm reminding you in ayah number two, Allah tells us the Prophet does four things, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Allah sent his messenger with a four-step process. And we talked about the first step of that process, which was yatlu alayhim ayatihi. He reads onto them his miraculous signs, his meaning Allah's signs. Just a few takeaways from that first step that I want to finish up from yesterday. Number one, he brings unfiltered exposure to the revelation exactly as it is. In other words, when he's reciting the ayat, he's not saying, here's the ayah, let me tell you what this really means. He's just telling you the ayah. The Prophet was reciting the ayah without an interpretation. He was just giving them the ayat directly. Surah Al-Asr was revealed and Abu Lahab and Abu Jahal and whoever heard Surah Al-Asr. They didn't stop at Al-Asr and say, hey, Tell me about Walasr, give me some details. That's not what happened. He gave it to them exactly as it is, right? Now this is important because 
in many religious traditions, people don't get the original message. They get the filtered message by some group, right? It's, if it's the Bible, maybe it's the Protestants that are interpreting it and telling it to their people, the clergymen, right? Or it's, if it's the Catholics, they're telling their version. Or if it's the rabbis, there's some group of rabbis that are interpreting and then telling their people. And others are telling their interpretation. So everybody's giving their version of what it might mean against the other version, you understand? So people are getting a filtered version of the message. But the yatlu alayhim ayatihi, what does it do? A direct exposure to the ayat. And what does that do? That, that, what that does necessarily is, if you hear the ayat, you'll say, what does that mean? Tell me more about this. I want to know more about this. You'll become curious. So it necessarily created curiosity about revelation by design. By design. Like if you hear something interesting, let me give you just, you know, because I come from the world of business and marketing before and tech before I got into Islamic stuff. So like in, in marketing, you first get exposed to, you know, like, like an ad is supposed to be compelling, right? So you, you see an ad and it should make you curious, right? Or what do they do with movies? They don't, how did they get people to go watch a movie? They show them a trailer, right? In which they put the most interesting scenes of the entire movie. So now you don't really need to watch the movie anymore. But still, the point is they, they get you curious, which makes you want to ask questions. I wonder what happens next. Or I wonder how this will play out. It makes you curious. So yatlu alihi mayati, the minimum unfiltered exposure, sometimes the unfiltered exposure does raise questions, creates curiosity. And that is supposed to make people want to say, hey, if make them interested and make them want to learn more. So that's the first thing. Then it makes revelation accessible. Like I said, in previous scriptures, previous religions, and many religions around the world, the scripture itself, the religious text itself, is very, it's very encoded. And you have to decipher it for the people to be able to access it. And there has to be a special group of people that can decode it for you. You cannot access it yourself. But when he says he went to the Ummiyin and he gave them the ayat directly, you see how he's removing the encoding process. Along this side, there's somebody who asked me a question. I was in Minnesota and I was at a, at a gathering and somebody asked me a question, a really cool question. He said, how come, you know, how can you interpret the Qur'an when the Prophet ﷺ is already there? He interpreted the Qur'an. Because the way to understand the Qur'an is through the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. This is a common misconception. So let me just tell you how to understand that clearly. The vast majority of the Qur'an, the Prophet has no commentary on. You should know that as a matter of fact. The vast majority of the Qur'an, when you study classical tafsir literature, you study an ayah, you're not going to find the Prophet commenting on that ayah, sallallahu alayhi wa That's not going to be the case. That happens on very rare occasions, arguably less than 1% of the time, is when you find the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa himself commenting on an ayah. Of course, there are sayings of the Prophet, alayhi sallallahu alayhi wa that seem to be in line with, or seem to help us understand some ayat of the Qur'an better, so they, they sync. There's a synchronization between Sunnah literature and the Qur'an. But that doesn't mean the Prophet is actually sitting and doing tafsir of the Qur'an directly. You understand? So the question then is, why didn't he do that? I mean, he's the best teacher to teach the Qur'an. Why didn't he just explain every single ayah of the Qur'an? So, you know, there's no room for any other kind of interpretation. The reason he didn't do that is Allah sent this book for people to ask questions. Ayatul Lissa'ideen, for people to ask questions. Allah said this book is for people who will contemplate his ayat. لِيَدَّبَّرُوا ayatihi. If the Prophet ﷺ spoke, it's like you have the answer key to every question. And if the answer key is already there, there's no room for you to think or to contemplate or to wonder or to ask because all because once the Prophet has spoken, who's going to speak after that? It's done with. There's no, there's no need after that, you understand? But the design of the Qur'an, the way the Qur'an was, was given to the Prophet ﷺ and the way that it spread, it was meant for people to think about what's being said for themselves, directly. But the most extreme case example of that, which I love, so, so you understand this point, is when the Prophet ﷺ was coming back from Ta'if. And if you don't know the story of Ta'if, he was nearly killed in Ta'if just for introducing Islam. They, near, they, they got hoodlums from the street, teenagers, rowdy teenagers, like Stuttgart on Friday night, right? They got those kinds of kids to just throw, throw rocks at him and bully him and run him, out, run, run him down the street, right? And when they did that, and he was bleeding, 
He he escapes Taif, bloodied and completely bloodied and muddled, and he stands in a, in a corner. He finds a place to pray, and he's just praying, reciting Quran out loud. The Quran was revealed to him, and he was reciting it. And at the time, some jinns were passing by, and they heard him pray and recite the Quran. So these jinns were hanging out by themselves, like where were you? Where were you last weekend? Jupiter. The other guy's like, oh, I was at the moon. I don't know. And then. They're hanging out by them, and then they hear, shh, what is that? And they start listening to the Qur'an. فَلَمَّا حَضَرُوهُ قَالُوا أَنْصِتُوا When they came in the presence of the Qur'an, they told each other to shut up and listen. That's what the Qur'an says. They told each other, shh, quiet. أَنْصِتُوا means be quiet and listen. So they started listening to the Qur'an. This is in Surah Al-Ahqaf, by the way, if you're curious. This is Surah number 46 of the Qur'an. And when they finished listening, they started commenting on what they just heard. We just heard a book that was sent down after Musa. It guides to the truth. And it guides to a clear, straight path. So they start having this, this commentary on what they just heard. And this commentary is recorded in the Quran. But the question is, did they learn that commentary from a teacher or they just thought about what they heard? They just, they heard something and they thought about it and their thoughts were so valuable that Allah included that in the Qur'an. Another example of that is there were some Christians that came to meet the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ recited some Qur'an to them. And when he started reciting the Qur'an to them, he says, Allah says, Tara أَعْيُنَهُمْ تَفِيضُ مِنَ الدَّمْعِ You will see their eyes begin to roll with tears. They started crying when they heard the Qur'an being recited. And they said, this is what we recognize from the truth. And they even said, "Inna kunna min qablihi muslimin." Even before this, we were Muslim. We didn't even know it, but we were actually Muslim even before this. And the, this feeling of theirs that they had, what did Allah do? He made that a part of the Quran. So, what is that teaching us? It's actually teaching us the Quran was designed for people to engage with it and to react to it and to think about it directly. You understand? So, this is part of yatlu alayhim ayatihi, making revelation accessible. Then the other thing is, its source is clear, which is really cool. When you get really, what, why, why did the Christians hear this and they started crying? Why did the jinn stop talking to each other and start listening to the Qur'an? Because they recognize this is from the highest of the heavens, right? right? It's from Al-Arsh, this is coming from the highest heavens. This is from Allah Himself. Which is actually cool because that's where we began. Allah created us right under the Arsh in the Jannat, in the Jannatul Ma'wa, right near Jannah. We were created in the company of the angels. Our beginnings are from the same place, in the same area where the Quran is coming from. And so, you know, when you meet someone who has the same origin, there's some level of familiarity. There's actually a level of familiarity deep inside a human soul when they hear the word of Allah. They actually, if you if you survey thousands of people that took shahada, that accepted Islam, whether they used to be Hindu or atheist or Christian or Jewish or any other religion and they accepted Islam, one of the common things you will find among them is, when I first understood Islam, I felt like this is something I've been feeling all this my, my whole life. I feel like it was already there. You know, it was just telling me something I already knew. Well, that's actually accurate because when we were created... Allah introduced Himself to us, alastu bi rabbikum, and now revelation is reintroducing, and it's actually something we already recognize inside. What Surah An Nur describes as nurun ala nur, light on top of light, the light we already have and the light of revelation. They meet each other, right? So this source being clear and familiar, familiar meaning we already knew this deep inside, and now it's actually coming back to us again. This is why we don't have in Islam, oh, give me the logical proofs of the existence of God, and only then I will believe in God. The Quran is actually arguing something deeper than that. The Quran is saying, the, the first evidence of the existence of God already lives inside you. It, deep inside your conscience, there's actually already an acknowledgement of God. And that acknowledgement has been covered by culture and your upbringing and society and corruption and your own sins. It's been covered up. And now all of that's going to get cleaned up by the coming of revelation and you'll be exposed to what you had deep inside you again. Right? So it's a, it's a really interesting philosophical argument about how human beings interact with revelation. Then the other is, let its miraculous power speak for itself. This is a long subject. The short version of it is as follows. The, the Qur'an is the first time 
that Allah combined two separate things into one. Before this, like for example, when Allah sent Salih alayhi salam or Hud alayhi salam or Musa alayhi salam, these prophets of Allah, then he sent them with a message, yeah? But when they gave their message, they also Allah also gave them some miracles. So he gave them two things, a message and miracles. And once you have the miracles, now you have no excuse to reject the message, right? So the purpose of the miracle was to validate the message. Most people already accepted the message, but some people said, we will not accept it until you show us a miracle. And then Allah would show them a miracle and they would still not accept it. And now that the miracle has been shown, they deserve punishment. So the miracle was kind of the last resort, right? It's not like the prophets didn't come starting off with their message with a miracle. Like even Musa alayhi salam, when he walked into the Pharaoh's court, he didn't walk in and throw his stick down and turn it into a snake and now let's talk. That's not what happened. He talked to him, he gave that. And when, when it became clear that no argument is going to help this guy, then finally he had to what? Throw the, st throw the staff and it turns into a snake. And this is because, in fact, if he didn't do that, he was about to be thrown in jail. Right? He said, Firaun said, if you don't take another, if you take another God besides me, I will make sure you get imprisoned with the others. That's when he said, Can I show you something instead? So, miracles were a separate thing. The message was a separate thing. What did the Quran do for the first time in human history? The message and the miracle were one thing. They're not two separate things. They're actually the same thing. So when people said, in Mecca, when people said, oh, you keep talking about these other prophets who had these miracles, where's yours? You say somebody dead came back to life, I miss my grandpa, can you bring him back? You say this, you know, the dead bird turned into a living bird, the clay bird turned into a living bird, can you turn this sand and turn it into some gold? We could use some gold around here, you know? How about you take these rocks and make them into waterfalls? You know, because you say the Israelites, when the Moses hit the staff, what happened to the rock? 12 springs, right? The Arabs said, we could use some extra water. I mean, look, it's kind of hot out here. So why don't you give us at least one? We're not asking for 12. Just give us one. Just give us one extra waterfall around here. Then you we'll be, might be interested in accepting your message. That's a good argument. And what did Allah respond with when they asked for that miracle? Allah said, أَوَلَمْ يَكْفِهِمْ أَنَّا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ يُطْلَعَ عَلَيْهِمْ Isn't it enough for them that we're giving them the book that's being read on to them? Meaning Allah is saying this book isn't just a message, it's also what? It's a miracle. And then he's challenged, that's why he's challenged them. What, if, it's not, if it's not a miracle, if it's just any speech, you should be able to make something better. You should be able to make something that, that destroys it, that defeats it, that doesn't have the effect on people that it has. That doesn't keep growing the way that it does. That doesn't penetrate the souls the way that it does. Bring a surah, like bring ten surahs. Okay, now bring ten surahs. Bring bring just a surah. Okay, ten is too much for you. Just bring one. Fatu bi surah ten. You know, this is actually so. So the as he was reciting the ayat, the fact that it's miraculous was also becoming clear to its listeners. That's why they were scared of it. So Dr. Samir Rai says something really interesting in one of his books about the, the, the phenomenon of the Qur'an. The Arabs were very well-spoken people. They were proud of their language, right? And when you say something, and I, I know this because I've traveled a lot, and my, you know, whenever I go to a community where there are elder Arabs, my ammus and my khalus, you know, they'll say, this was good speech, but you could have made it better if you did this, this, and this. If you added this ayah, this hadith, oh, it would have been so good. They're very keen about the speech being better and perfect. This, 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 this is missing, this is missing. And this is what they used to do with each other in poetry, right? Uh, you, have, uh, you, know, in, you have poetry slams or you know, rap battles and stuff like that, where one, one rapper disses the other one, he roasts the other one, and the other one roasts him back. You know what the Arabs did? They didn't roast each other. They did roast too, by the way. There's classical Arabic roasts. They're pretty good. Um, but then there's the other thing. They would somebody would make poetry, and somebody would come out and say, "That was good, but uh, could be better." Like one poet says, "You know, uh, we have bowls, jafanat al shiny bowls that shine during the day. 
what he's talking about is when, when the tribes would give charity, they would have these bowls to give charity in, right? So the, he, he wanted to show how, how, how generous his tribe is. So we have shiny bowls that shine during the day. And Khansa comes and says, what, I mean, why did you say Jafanat? You could have said Jifan. Jafanat means less than 10 bowls. So you don't have that many bowls? If you said Jifan, it would have mean you have endless bowls, meaning you got lots more money. Psh, wrong word, bro. That is, he says, Yal ma'na bid duha. Yal ma'na means they, 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 sh they reflect light. She goes, reflect light means they only shine when there's light. You should have said yushriqna, they give off light. <laughs> then she says, you said ad duha. You said they, they, they shine during the day. I was like, everything shines during the day. <laughs> you should have said they shine when? At night time. And then in his next line of poetry, he said, And our swords, they, they drip with the blood of the enemy. You know what that means? We go to so many battles, we don't even get a chance for our swords to dry up. Because our swords keep dripping with the blood of the enemy. That's, he was talking about how brave his tribe is. And she said, You only have like eight swords? So just eight guys go to battle for you? Nine, nine guys? It's less than this. Jama'a qilla. You should have said suyufuna. And you said yaktarna. So you, what do you, what do you do? You, you cut, you give pa your enemy paper cuts? You, your swords drip? If you were real killers, then your swords should have been flowing with the blood of the enemy. Yajrina. <laughs> and then you said daman. Daman means blood, but it means a drop of blood. You should have said dima'an, rivers of blood. What is this? <laughs> Get out of here. This is how critical they were of what? Every word. But when they hear the Qur'an, it, because they're so critical, they could have said, Wal Asr, should have said, Wal Dahr. You said, Inna l-insana lafi khusr. You should have said, Inna nasa lafi khusran. Should have used a different word. Did anybody say that? Abu Jahal is there. Abu Lahab is there. Walid, Walid ibn Mughira is there. Some of their best poets are there. Their rap battle winners are there from last year. Everybody's there. And nobody says a word. How come? And then they say, he's crazy. He's a poet. He's a magician. Wait, if he's a magician, then what's the magic trick? If he's crazy, then why are people so impressed? And if he is a poet, then you should be able to come up with much better what? Poetry. Okay, no, 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 no. He's something. I don't know what he is. He's, somebody else is teaching him. Tumla alayhi bukratan wa asrila. You know, he's, he's being dictated to. People, somebody else, we don't know who it is, but somebody's teaching him. They, they could, and you know what that, the public was seeing? We've never seen our intellectuals so baffled. We've never seen them so, this is not being defeated. Its miraculous power was speaking for itself. And then finally, people may now recognize the ayat are all around them. This is really cool. The word ayah, I talked to you about that yesterday, right? The Qur'an doesn't just use the word ayah for the statements in the Qur'an. Those are ayat too. I don't use the word verses. I don't like it. I just use ayat. Uh, and I've explained in other lectures why I don't use the word verse. Because verse sounds like poetry. Right? And verse also sounds like biblical. But the Qur'an doesn't actually have poetic or biblical references. It's, it's actually a unique structure by itself. So just ayah. A, a divine sign, a miraculous sign. That's what I call it. Anyway, the Quran didn't just reveal what Allah says about prophets or about heaven and hell, etc. Allah teaches me that there's an ayah inside the tree. There's an ayah inside the cloud. There's an ayah inside the camel. There's an ayah inside the desert. There's an ayah in the sun. There's an ayah in the moon. There's an ayah in night and day. There's an ayah inside me. There's an ayah in marriage. There's an ayah in the differences in people's tongues and languages. There's an ayah in uh, people's different skin colors. All of these are also what? Ayat. They have ayat in them. All of them. This is what Allah keeps saying. Now what did he do? He made me think, oh, I thought I was studying the ayat when I was reading the book. Because the book is made up of ayat. But then he's telling me, that has an ayah in it. 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 You know what that does? I'm in the ayat when I'm in the book. And I'm also in the ayat when I'm outside the book and I never knew. I thought it was just a tree. Now I know it's actually an ayah. I thought it was just a camel. That's actually an ayah. But then the Quran teaches you 
and teaches me how is that an ayah? How is the wind an ayah? How is, how is the sun an ayah? Without it, I could learn a lot about the sun in science class, but I won't learn that it is what? It's an ayah. The Quran came and changed the world around me and I started seeing ayat everywhere. And the more ayat I see in the world, it takes me back to what he teaches me about those ayat. And the more I read the Quran, it makes, makes me go back into the universe and explore those ayat. So those ayat pull me back towards these ayat and these ayat push me back towards those ayat and they keep, I keep going between the ayat. So when the Prophet ﷺ is reciting the ayat to them, he's changing their worldview. People now recognize that ayat are all around them. Right? So it's a very powerful phrase that's used as the opening statement of these four steps. Assalamu alaikum everyone. There are almost 50,000 students around the world that are interested on top of the students we have in studying the Quran and its meanings and being able to learn that and share that with family and friends. And they need sponsorships, which is not very expensive. So if you can help sponsor students on Bayina TV, please do so and visit our sponsorship page. I appreciate it so much and pray that Allah gives our mission success and we're able to share the meanings of the Quran and the beauty of it the world over.